here is our review of photosynthesis. Um, so, so this is a little bit of SO, uh, that 2.9, and then I also have thrown in here some extra details that we'll need to know not until next year for HO. But it's never a bad thing to know more than you have to, um, especially for those of us who are headed into some kind of science in college. So photosynthesis uses energy from the sun to produce chemical energy, glucose basically, needed for life. Um, we use that glucose, of course, to make ATP. And um, light energy is converted into chemical energy. And we'll those more details that we need for each other. So here's a generalized plant structure. Um, so of course we have roots, we have stem, we have leaves and flowers. Leaves are where the majority of photosynthesis is going to occur in a plant. Here I'm zooming into one little cross section of a leaf. So the top of the leaf is going to have this waxy substance called cuticle to help prevent it from dehydrating too much. We have epidermis and just kind of like skin. So there's a layer of basically plant skin cells. And then under that is this palisade mesophyll layer. Palisade mesophyll is where the great majority of photosynthesis occurs in the leaf. Um, these guys are packed right under this upper surface of the leaf so that the chloroplasts have lots and lots of access to the sunshine that is shining down on the upper surface of the leaf. Under the palisade mesophyll, we have spongy mesophyll. There's lots of space here for gas exchange to occur. In photosynthesis, we need to get CO2 into the plant. We need to get oxygen and water vapor out. So CO2 is actually going to enter the plant through these openings on the lower surface of the leaf called stoma um, or stomata for plural. And CO2 gets in, H2O and O2 gets out. This is gas exchange, kind of like a plant breathing-ish. Um, lots of space here, again, for gas exchange to occur. That CO2 is going to make its way into the palisade mesophyll's mesophyll cells. Um, see, uh, the oxygen gas and water vapor are going to get out. These are the, basically the blood vessels of plants. Of course, plants don't have blood, um, but this is how sugar and, which is the sap, um, water, other minerals are transported around the plant is through these vessels called xylem and phloem. Guard cells open and close the stoma. So if it is dry or hot, the plant can close these down to prevent too much water loss. So I'm going to focus in on one of those palisade mesophyll cells. Never mind, we're going to look at the leaf one more time. I forgot this slide was here. Um, so here at the top layer, again, we have the cuticle. So A is the cuticle, so waxy layer to prevent dehydration. Here we have the upper epidermis, it's basically the skin of the leaf. Here we have the palisade mesophyll, which is where the majority of photosynthesis is going to occur. This is the spongy mesophyll. Lots of space so that gases can move around. So we get CO2 into those cells, get O2 and water vapor out. Um, these are guard cells, which can open and close the stoma. Stoma is going to allow for gases to get into the leaf and out of the leaf. So here we're going to zoom in on just one cell. So this thick layer here is cell wall composed of um, cellulose. Cellulose is a beta glucose polymer, so it is a carbohydrate, a structural carbohydrate. Just inside we have here, whoopsie, we have here the cell membrane. So we've got cell wall, and then just inside the wall, we have that cell membrane. Inside the cell membrane, just like in animal cells, is going to be some cytoplasm. This big empty space, the central vacuole, this is going to hold lots of water and minerals so the plant can carry out photosynthesis. These little guys here are mitochondria. You can see the little squiggles inside that inner membrane, the pre-state of the inner membrane. This guy here, of course, is the nucleus, clearly an interphase. This is the nucleolus, where we're going to make new ribosomes, more RNA. And then these guys, we're focusing on the rest of today, these are the chloroplasts.
So now I zoom in of a chloroplast. Chloroplast has two membranes, outer and inner. And then inside the inner membrane is stroma, which sounds a lot like stoma. They are not the same. So the stroma with the R is the juicy part inside the chloroplast, inside the inner membrane, but outside the thylakoid. The stroma is where the Calvin cycle is going to occur. The, um, these pancakes, these stacks of pancake membrane, this is called thylakoid membrane. This is where electron transport chain ATP synthesis are embedded. This is where the light dependent reactions occur. Now, if I take these thylakoid membranes and I make a stack of them like this, I'm going to call that stack a granum. The benefit of having these pancakes is that there's a pretty small space inside, which means that we're going to talk a little bit about how we work really hard, well, not we, the plant. The plant works really hard to pump hydrogen ions inside here. This being a pretty small space allows for that concentration gradient to go up pretty fast. If this was a big open space, it would take more hydrogens to increase the concentration. Pretty small space, that small volume allows the um, build up of hydrogen ions to happen more quickly. Then the lamella, these are going to connect the different grana. Um, good. So here's another chloroplast picture. That this one is a little trickier because it's not a drawing. So here is going to be outer and inner membranes. Here are our thylakoid pancakes. That stack of pancakes is called granum. If I have more than one, they are grana. These guys are the lamella. The lamella are connecting the different grana. And then these, we would love to call them ribosomes. They're a little bit too big to be ribosomes. These are actually starch granules. Um, when the glucose is getting formed, it often is bound together into starch for longer term storage. This space in here, inside the membranes, but outside the thylakoid, this is going to be some of the stroma uh, with an R. And um, there are also tiny little ribosomes in here, but they'd be far smaller than are those starch granules. Factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. Temperature. Um, photosynthesis is carried out by enzymes. And so, uh, however temperature affects enzymes, is also going to affect photosynthesis. So as the temperature rises, we're going to have an increase in the rate because there are more collisions. The enzymes have more heat energy. Things run into each other more often, um, which is going to allow for more reactions to happen up until an ideal temperature, um, after which the enzymes start to denature, and the rate is going to decrease pretty fast. Light intensity on photosynthetic rate, uh, the more light there is, the faster photosynthesis is going to happen, up until a point where we're going to plateau, the reaction kind of levels off. The rate doesn't increase anymore. Um, the rate kind of stays the same, and the reason is because the enzymes are all saturated. They are working as fast as they can. It doesn't matter how much more light we add, those enzymes are just, they're all doing what they're doing. Um, carbon dioxide concentration. So again, um, the more carbon dioxide that we have, the more we can increase that rate of reaction until we have enzyme saturation again, and the rate is going to plateau. This um, is the um, either action spectrum, I'm going to call it the spectrum because we're looking at different colors, action spectrum or absorbance um, graph. Here on the x-axis we have wavelengths of light, oh my gosh, what happened, um, which are in nanometers. And I hate that you have to know nanometers, but keep in mind that wavelengths that we're looking at are in nanometers. Um, there's a lot of absorbent here in the blues and purples, a lot of absorbent here in the oranges and reds. Green is the least absorbed color of plants. The reason that plants look green is because that's the one color of light that the plants don't hold onto. It's the one that they reflect back, back to our lights. So the worst light for plant growth for our photosynthesis is actually green, which is weird because plants are green. Um, but they're green because that's the one color of light that gets reflected off the plant 
and back to our eyeballs. So we can call this the action spectrum or the absorbance spectrum, the colors of light that are being either absorbed or the ones that are helping to make photosynthesis happen. So absorbance or action spectrum. Chromatography is the way that we can look at those different pigments and go back to screen. So here, there are, there are lots of different lines because not all of the, um, not, not everything is chlorophyll. So we talk a lot about chlorophyll and how it carries out photosynthesis. There are actually other things, xanthophylls, um, carotenes, beta carotene that can help carry out photosynthesis as well. Chlorophyll, of course, is going to be the most common ones. These are what makes our plants look clean, but these other guys exist. And so I can actually separate these different um, plant pigments, these light absorbing pigments from leaves with chromatography. And what we do is we smash some plant stuff onto the bottom of this filter paper, this chromatography paper, we dip it into some stuff, some kind of solvent, usually a non-polar solvent like acetone or hexane. And then that solvent is going to, per capillary action, rise up the paper. Some of the plant stuff is going to get dissolved in that solvent and it's going to get carried up the filter paper. The less polar, the non-polar, the less polar, the more non-polar, the pigment is, the more it's going to rise with the solvent. The more polar it is, the more it's going to stick to the paper, so it's not going to go very far with the solvent. And then I can measure from the plant stuff that we smashed onto the paper up to the top of the uh, solvent line, and I can measure that distance. Maybe that's like 10 centimeters. And then I measure to where my pigment went and maybe that's 9.5 centimeters. And then I can divide these two, 9.5 divided by 10, 0.95, and that's my RF value. So this is just showing me the distance compared to the solvent that each one of the pigments moved. It allows us to separate the pigments based on their polarities. So now, finally, talking about photosynthesis. So photosynthesis occurs um, by using some carbon dioxide and some water, we use energy from the sunshine. This, all of these enzymes and chlorophyll, we produce glucose, oxygen, and water. There are two main cycles. We have the light reactions, and then we have the Calvin cycle, which is also called the light independent reactions. The light reactions happen on the thylakoid membranes. The Calvin cycle, the light independent reactions happen in the stroma. So here's another version of a summary, but in flowchart form. So our light dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid, thylakoid. Um, light energy is going to be absorbed by chlorophyll in the process of photolysis. Water gets split into oxygen, hydrogen, and electrons. The hydrogen and electrons are picked up by NAD P plus and turned into NADPH. We also um, get those electrons to jump on the electron transport chain. That energy is used to pump hydrogen ions into the thylakoid space. Um, that then results in chemiosmosis. Um, sorry, that got weird on the edge of the screen. That chemiosmosis, um, the movement of hydrogen ions down the concentration gradient through ATP synthesis, allows ATP synthesis to glue together ADP and inorganic phosphate to make ATP. The NADPH um, that was formed during the light dependent reactions, the ATP that was formed, is then used in the light independent reactions, which is also called the Calvin cycle, um, which happens in the stroma, not in the thylakoid. Um, so we use carbon dioxide, the NADPH, ATP, energy, hydrogens, and electrons, um, Calvin cycle, carbon fixation, we're going to glue the carbons together, um, and there's some reduction and some regeneration that we'll look at later, and that's going to make our organic compounds. The first is a triose phosphate, which is a three-carbon sugar, which is then glued together to make glucose. So let's look a little bit more at the light-dependent reactions. Um, hydrolysis occurs. 
specifically photolysis. Um, so we use energy from the sun to split the water. We're going to split that water into oxygen, gas, hydrogen ions, also called protons. Remember that H plus is the same thing as a hydrogen ion. It's the same thing as proton. Um, we use those three terms, hydrogen ion, H plus proton. They're all the same. So, so the electrons that get pulled off of the water molecule during photolysis get chunked onto photosystem 2, PS2 photosystem 2. Light energy from the sun is going to zap those electrons to higher energy levels. Those excited high energy electrons are then passed along the electron transport chain. The energy from those electrons moving along the electron transport chain is used to pump more protons out of the stroma into the thylakoid space, the lumen, or the space inside those pancakes. This leads to a pretty high concentration of hydrogens inside the thylakoid space, the lumen of the thylakoid. This is against the laws of nature. The hydrogen ions don't like to be all hoarded together. They would rather diffuse, spread out. Um, but because they have a charge and we have very non-polar um, fatty acid tails in this membrane, hydrogen ions can't just go through the membrane. Their only path is through ATP synthase. The movement of those hydrogen ions through ATP synthase, that movement, that energy of them moving, is used by ATP synthesis, by ATP synthase, to glue together ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate molecule to form ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Some of those H pluses are picked up by NADP plus, but wait, there's more. Those electrons that lost energy on the electron transport chain are passed from the electron transport chain to photosystem one, where there's sunshine. Again, and that sunshine is going to re-zap those electrons, make them high energy, and they get chunked onto NADP plus with some of those hydrogen ions to form NADPH. This reaction is called a reduction reaction because the NADP plus got extra electrons and hydrogens to form NADPH. The ATP and the NADPH is then used in the Calvin cycle. Um, all of this is occurring in the thylakoid membrane and then inside the thylakoid space. Here's same idea, different picture. Um, again, we have water going through photolysis getting chunked into oxygen, gas, hydrogen, ions, and electrons. Here are our electrons that get zapped on photosystem two with energy from the sunshine. They get past the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain uses the energy from those electrons to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma outside the thylakoid into the inside of the thylakoid, the thylakoid space. I now have a high concentration of those hydrogen ions inside that pancake, inside that thylakoid pancake. Those electrons on the electron transport chain, they've lost a bunch of energy. They get passed on to photosystem one. Um, here they are re-energized with light from the sunshine again. That high energy um, electron, those high energy electrons are then given to NADP plus and turned into NADPH. NADP plus picks up electrons from photosystem one and also picks up some of the hydrogens um, that are escaping the thylakoid through ATP synthase. This combination, NADP plus, plus the hydrogen ions, plus the electrons, forms NADPH, which is going to be used in the Calvin cycle or the light independent reactions. We talked about those hydrogen ions building up. We've got a high concentration gradient here of hydrogen ions inside the thylakoid. This goes against the laws of nature. Those hydrogen ions want to spread out. They want to diffuse. They don't actually want anything. They don't have brains. But the laws of nature tend toward chaos, tend toward things spreading out. The only path for these hydrogen ions out of the inside of the thylakoid out of that lumen or that space inside the thylakoid is through this molecule, ATP synthase. The movement of the hydrogen ions through ATP synthase, by the way, is called chemiosmosis. Um, we're going to use this energy of the hydrogen ions moving through ATP synthase to glue together ADP and inorganic phosphate, which is going to form ATP. This is not the ATP that this 
that the cell is going to use for mitosis, for growth, for making seeds. This is ATP that we're just going to use the Calvin cycle to make glucose. So that NADPH and the ATP is then going to move into the stroma. Um, and we're going to go through the Calvin cycle. There are three main stages, carbon fixation, reduction, and regeneration. In carbon fixation, we're going to take some carbon dioxide that was I'm using the word inhale. Plants don't actually inhale, but CO2 diffused into the leaf. That CO2 is used in this carbon fixation step. Um, there is a uh, there's an enzyme called Rubisco. The enzyme Rubisco is going to glue together three of these RUBP ribulose biphosphate molecules and three CO2s. So Rubisco glues those two guys together. They get all smashed up and rearranged, and we end up with six molecules of glycerate-3-phosphate, which we abbreviate with GP. Those six glycerate-3-phosphate molecules that were formed during carbon fixation, when I fixed or glued three carbon dioxides to three ribulose biphosphates, we end up with six glycerate-3-phosphate molecules. These guys are then reduced. We give them some extra electrons and hydrogens. We do that with energy from ATP. This was made in the light-dependent reactions in the thylakoid. Um, and we also use some NADPH. Again, this was made in the light-dependent reactions on the thylakoid. So we use that ATP and the NADPH to turn glycerate 3-phosphate into triose phosphate, or TP. This is reduction because glycerate 3-phosphate gets electrons and hydrogens to turn into this guy, TP. We make six of them. Five of those TPs are then regenerated. We turn them back into our UBP. We use more energy from ATP to get that done. Five of them turn back into our UBP, but we had six of them. That six the TP, that six triose phosphate, exits the Calvin cycle as one TP it will find another TP that was exited from the Calvin cycle in another turn. Those two TPs together, triose phosphate plus triose phosphate, will turn into what we call a hexose, or a six carbon sugar like glucose. So TP, TP, those are half a glucose. Um, we have two triose phosphates to make one glucose. The Five triose phosphates that were regenerated into RUBP will then be fixed to more CO2 using that enzyme Rubisco to make GP. The GP is reduced to make TP. Five of them get turned back into RUBP. One of them is going to exit to be half a glucose. The RUBP that we make from the five TPs are going to get fixed to CO2, and it just keeps going and going and going. Who figured this out? Calvin Calvin figured this out with an experiment that we call the lollipop. Because it, it kind of looks like a lollipop. So what he did was he added radioactive carbon dioxide to this mashup of algae cells. And he extracted the products over time. And he looked to see what compounds had that radioactive material first. This was early on. This is the stuff that's radioactive. This is later on. This is more stuff that was radioactive. So basically, he took this cycle, and instead of having regular old CO2, he added radioactive CO2, and he looked to see what was made. The first thing that was made was GP. The first radioactive compound that he found was GP, glycerate 3-phosphate. So he was able to figure out, ha-ha, this must be first in our step. If the first radioactive carbon compound formed is GP, this must be the first thing formed. The second compound that was made was TP. And then he saw that there was some RUPP that had radioactive carbon, so it had to have come from the cycle. So that's how Calvin figured out the cycle, um, was by adding some radioactive carbon dioxide in his lollipop experiment. And that is the end of our review of photosynthesis. As always, let me know if you have questions.